This is the third class in a series given by Brother Matthew Blewett on the subject, Meditations in Revelation. This class is titled, Names and Places. See that. So we're going to carry on with our Meditations in Revelation. And what we're going to be doing in the next three sessions is really uh, sharing some meditations with you, hopefully through that process, maybe sharing some spiritual insights, uh, also just going over the, the approach that, that I've used and, and, and through example, hopefully uh, encouraging and inspiring more people to want to use Revelation as a, a meditation book, um, a book to, to gain these spiritual principles for today. And what I've tried to also do in the next three sessions is to, is to group the meditations into uh, reveal the diversity of the book of Revelation that I've spoken to. So you'll see today we're going to use some examples of meditations that refer to places and, and people. So if you're the kind of person that likes to think about relationships and that talks your language, then Revelation's got something for you. Tomorrow we'll look at numbers. If you're more of a spreadsheet numbers person, then Revelation's got uh, passages for you. And uh, the last day we'll look at colors, colors and pictures. So if you're more of an arty person, Revelation can speak to you as well. And I think that's the power of the whole Bible, but specifically seen in the book of Revelation. It's 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 diversity in the way that it's expressing the message. And and I think that's very powerful for us to, to use in our own preaching, that we've got to realize we're talking to people from different backgrounds who have different languages that they communicate, and we can't have only one method of doing that. And I think it's beautifully summarized in the book of Revelation. So we're going to start with a, a little Revelation bit a uh, very small uh, meditation, and then I'm going to go through uh, what I've called in the past uh, Revelation Bites, where um, we've got something that we've chased up a bit further and, and some interesting insights that have come from uh, my meditations. So uh, starting with this uh, passage uh, uh, from a very well-known passage, uh, let's go back where we can get it on full screen or as best as we can, um, and it's from Revelation chapter 14. And uh, we uh, have read this passage, I guess, many times before. It says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So one morning, that was my meditation, uh, a passage that you think, well, what uh, spiritual insight can we get from this passage? And so as I was thinking and focusing on it and uh, trying to focus on the detail of a passage that I've read so many times before, and as I've mentioned before, it's in passages that we've read so many times before that we've got to work a bit harder to, to try and see perhaps the message for us. And the thing that caught my attention is this phrase, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. In fact, it's used like in, in that same way, actually originally in the book of Isaiah. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And, you know, it comes off our lips so easily, doesn't it? And we know that in the, in the New Testament specifically, often a word is repeated for emphasis. Jesus would say, uh, truly, truly, I say unto you, verily, verily. In other words, what I'm about to say is, is important. You need to concentrate. But on the morning that I was thinking about this, I, I thought a bit more deeply about this idea that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And what got me thinking is, is as I, I was thinking about the echoes of Babylon, I mean, the obvious thought came to my mind. Here in the book of Revelation, Babylon is such an important city. It, it's, a, it's a big part of the narrative. And yet we know that Babylon shouldn't even be here because the Babylon that we have met in, 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 in the time of Daniel and in the prophecies of Isaiah and, and, and the other major prophets uh, has been destroyed. It was prophesied that it would be destroyed. Um, we all know this well-known prophecy. Um, so the echo that, 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 that obviously is from our first principles is this idea that uh, Babylon, as we can see, uh, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, it will never be inhabited. And of course, we take this beautiful prophecy from Isaiah and we say, there it is. It's been fulfilled. Babylon is destroyed. You can go there. And the fact that it remains a ruin is a continuous proof of the, the power that God has over the nations. And yet we sort of glibly come into Revelation and we find this Babylon and it's there and it's alive. And of course, the way we reconcile that is quite simply, we say, well, that, that's the physical Babylon. That was destroyed. And here in the book of Revelation, we're being taught that there is a spirit of Babylon. 
which is an interesting insight because often we spend more time trying to identify a particular city that is Babylon, whereas the fact that physical Babylon remains destroyed is screaming at us that what we have in Revelation is the spirit of Babylon brought to life, not necessarily in one city, but in a way that demonstrates all that Babylon stood for. And we'll actually see that a bit later in another one of our meditations. So, so that's an interesting echo. And so this idea that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is perhaps making us also think that in fact Babylon has to be destroyed twice. And, 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 and that's an interesting idea when we view sin itself. Um, we, we understand, as Jesus said, that we've got to be very careful in our, our view of sin that sin actually has to be dealt with on the outside and the inside. We can live lives like the Pharisees were living, where it looks like they've dealt with all the outside manifestations of their sin. As he said, you've made the outside look very clean. But you haven't dealt with the, the inside. The thoughts and intents of your heart have not been dealt with. And, and really, in this sense, we're taught that sin requires a, a double blow. It needs to be dealt with Twice, as it were. Uh, David uh, summarizes this beautifully in Psalm 51. He says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Okay, that's, I need forgiveness for the things that I've done wrong. But that alone doesn't deal with my problem. You know, you can, you can, you know, kill the tree, but if you haven't dealt with the roots or take out the weed, but if you haven't taken out the roots, it's coming back. I need to also have my heart cleaned. This is what David understood. I need, I need you to come in and change my very way of thinking. Because even though today I didn't do that thing that I didn't want to do, tomorrow it's coming back. So, so sin in a way needs to be destroyed, obviously in the outside. We need to work and stop ourselves from doing the things that we ought not to do. But the way that ultimately takes place is by the inside also being cleansed. So perhaps there's this idea that Babylon is fallen, is fallen teaching us that we need to understand that sin in our lives requires the double blow that David, I think, is referring to. So there's a quick thought just from the idea of, of Babylon has fallen, has fallen. A little tidbit in that same little uh, uh, passage is the idea that Babylon is always referred to as Great Babylon uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in, in both actually in Revelation and in uh, many of the, the texts that we find in Isaiah. And you might want to think about why What's the reason for that echo? The word great, by the way, in Greek is the word mega. We still use that word today. So I'll leave you with that thought for yourself. I want us now to go to this passage, which is the passage, uh, if you've got your Bibles open, because that's not very clear. Still battling with resolution here. Uh, if we go to Revelation chapter 7, you might want to open your Bibles. Thanks for that. Uh, Revelation chapter 7. And uh, there is the, the, the passage that deals with the, the sealed of God. Very well-known, uh, beautiful passage describing what we call the 144,000. These who have been washed, had their clothes washed in the, the blood of the Lamb and have been sealed with the name of God on their foreheads. And one morning when I was considering this passage, what caught my attention, what caught my focus is the way when this this multitude are described. I heard how many there were uh, who were mocked with the seal of the Lord. 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. All right, and I think in another version it says from the children, the tribes of the children of Israel. We're going to highlight that in a moment. And then he goes on to say, I'll tell you how those 144,000 were made up. And he then mentions each of the tribes and gives us the, the, the number. 12,000 for Judah, 12,000 for Reuben, 12,000 for Levi, and I won't go through all the lists. What caught my attention, and this is what often catches your attention when you're meditating, is the level of detail again. I mean, he could have stopped by saying, you know, I saw a great crowd, 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel. And we would have had a, a good picture. But he goes specifically to mention each of the names of the tribes, and to tell us that each of them is allocated 12,000. So I think, you know, again, from a, from a high-level point of view, oh, there we go, just needed to press the button and it would have got nice and clear. From a high-level point of view, what we're seeing is, is this beautiful idea that 
amongst the sealed of God, amongst the revealed, the redeemed, there's a place for all of us. There's a place for everyone. It's, it's an entry of abundance. There's an abundant entry. Often we, we obviously look with fear and, and uncertainty. Will there be a place for me? But the message in Revelation, and certainly in this passage, is there's a place for everyone. There's 12,000 for every tribe. And, and I think the reason every tribe is named is, in a way, yes, we know the, the allusions to uh, the, the spiritual Israel and, and back to each of the tribes, and we'll look at that in a moment. But the point is, each tribe also represented, I've been talking about diversity, different characteristics, and all of them are there. All of your cultural backgrounds, all of your heritage, all of your personality traits, God has a place for every one of you, and you're equally treated, 12,000 for each. And, and of course, that message is coming out strongly because when we go back to look at the tribes as they were recorded in, 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 in numbers, when the numberings were done, they were certainly not equal in size. Some of the tribes were two times the volume in terms of population, the number, than other tribes. Had some very fertile women in their tribes. So, but, but when we come to the message of, of, of the seal of God, every tribe receives 12,000, abundant entry. Space for everyone. That's inspiration for us. But then, of course, we do notice a little detail. A little detail becomes apparent, and it's this detail. Here is the, the tribes of the children of Israel, and he goes through each of them and names them. And, and what do we notice? Well, there's a list in Revelation chapter 7. When we go back to Genesis chapter 29, where we have a list of the children of Israel, we notice, of course, that the list in Revelation chapter 7 is missing someone. And that is Dan. Now, you'll know that in Numbers chapter 1, when the tribes are listed in terms of the way that they camped around the tabernacle, Ephraim and Manasseh, as a part of the double portion, come in to replace Joseph. And Levi, although remaining as a tribe, was not one of the tribes that camped in the 12 uh, encampments, the, the three encampments on the four points of the compass. But I think when you look at the comparison between Revelation chapter 7 and Genesis 29 being the children of Israel, and that's the reference that's made in Revelation chapter 7, the missing person actually is Dan. What's happened is Levi has been brought back in, uh, as you can see, and then Joseph is brought back because he is one of the children, and in place of Dan, in, in place of Dan is Manasseh, who in fact was the firstborn uh, child of Joseph, perhaps uh, he's there because of the double portion. I'm sure we could have discussions about that. But the missing tribe is Dan. You know, I thought about it. I thought, imagine this. You know, it's, it, 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 this beautiful scene is painted. Imagine if you were a part of the tribe of Dan. And, and you come to, to this Revelation chapter 7. And you come to, to imagine the picture. And you know, like when we all look through photograph albums, if we're honest, we're looking through a photograph album, we look at the photos, and suddenly we're looking for one of ourselves. We suddenly stop, oh, there I am. We, you know, we're drawn to ourselves. We might not want to show it. We, but, but if you were of the tribe of Dan, and you were reading Revelation chapter 7, you wouldn't be very happy. Because we're not there. And so it got my mind thinking about why. Why would, in this, in this picture of abundance, in this picture of God making place for every tribe, specifically one tribe, is left out? So let's take a while just to think about what spiritual lesson we can take from missing Dan. Now this idea of, of one being missing amongst the chosen is, is echoed definitely in the life of Jesus. Uh, remember when Jesus said in, in, in John 6, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you is a devil? So there's a, a lovely echo there. 12 chosen, one has turned. 12 tribes, 12 children of Israel, one is not there. Of course, in the case of, of Judas, we know he was a betrayer. He was not prepared to wait for Jesus to work out his own purpose. He wanted to force the issue, whatever your view is as to why he betrayed Jesus. So that's quite clear. But, but Dan... Is it the same spirit in Dan that, that will not allow us to be a part of those redeemed? It's an important question. So let's think a bit more about the answer. Let's go in search of Dan. Now, typically, people will say to you, and, and I've certainly heard it, that Dan is missing from this list, and I'm sure some of you have thought about it, because his name means to judge. And, and this list of people that we have 
uh, in, in Revelation chapter 7 are the redeemed. Mercy, we've been talking about that uh, throughout this week, ha- triumphs over judgment. So in a sense, from just the meaning of his name, we shouldn't expect to find him there because these are the ones who have had mercy. So I guess there's some merit in that. But when we dig deeper and we understand and we look for the echoes, I think there's a greater spiritual principle underlying why someone might be missing despite the availability of mercy. So, so yes, dad's name does mean to judge, to contend, to vindicate. The question is, what is meant by that judgment? What do we mean by that judgment? And the way to answer the question, of course, is what we'll do just now, is to go back to Genesis and to try and understand what was the very genes, the very DNA of Dan. Before we do that, some interesting things. Dan, uh, as a name, both referring to the individual and the tribe, appears about 60 times in the Bible. Uh, this, this surprised me. He's the fifth most referenced son of Jacob. So you've got the obvious guys that you would think are in the, in the top spot, Judah, um, Levi, obviously, being mentioned quite a lot of times. But here is Dan, fifth in line. Um, he's mentioned uh, a, a lot more than some other uh, quite famous, I think Reuben, for example, he's mentioned far less times than Dan. He was the firstborn. So he becomes quite an important tribe in, 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 in the land of Israel. He's the only son of Israel who's not mentioned at all in the New Testament. At all. So not in Revelation, nowhere in the New Testament. Um, so, interesting. Let's do what we've been saying we'd like to do and go back to Genesis and see if we can find out something about Dan. And I think the essence of the spirit of Dan is actually captured in his naming and his birth. So, this is what happens when he is born. Rachel said, God has vindicated me. Remember, that was one of the, the translations of his name. In the King James Version, it says, God has judged me. He has listened to my plea and given me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan. So here, she's capturing the very spirit of the birth of her son, Dan. Now, I want you to think a bit about that word that's being used. The translators choose to use the word vindicate. It's slightly different in our language to the word judge. I think it's actually a bit more helpful. The idea there is that God has come through for me. He, and, and she says that. I, I pleaded to him. He, he's listened to my plea. And and he's given me what I wanted, which was a son. As we unravel the story, we're going to see that there's nothing true about that. And this is where the real spiritual truth lies. That's been revealed to us, I believe, by focusing on the missing Dan in Revelation chapter 7. So how does the story begin? Well, you know the story. Uh, There's two wives and they're in a baby competition. And of course, Rachel was... The first wife, she was the favorite. And all she wanted to do was to give her husband a son, but she was barren, and Leah was just producing the wives, one after uh, the wives, the sons, one after another. Four in a row, every season. And she becomes desperate. And look at what she says. She says, when she saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I will die. So immediately we learn a lot about Rachel, don't we? She, she has a problem. She's desperate for children. She doesn't get on her knees like Hannah and pray to God because she, Hannah knew that, that that's where children come from. She goes to Jacob and says, give me children or I will die. Jacob, of course, being a man of faith, answers correctly. Jacob became angry with her. And said, am I in place of God who has kept you from having children? So he points her in the direction that she should be going. He says, I'm not the one who can give you children. It's God. And I want you to notice those words. Am I in place of God? Am I the substitute for God in this case? And so he's encouraging her. And so what does Rachel do? Does she get on her knees like Hannah and pray for children as she said she did? Does she plead for children? That's not on the record. Maybe she did, but it's not the way the writer of Genesis chooses to reveal the story to us. This is what she does. So she said, here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. She came up with a solution. Ironically, the solution she came up with was the very solution that God had said to her father-in-law, his father, Right? Remember when Abraham was wondering where the promised seed would come from? 
Was it going to come through Eliezer? Was it going to come through uh, his handmaid that had been given to him from Sarah? And God said very clearly, no, 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 no. Your wife, Sarah, will bear you a child. So in the family, they had already learned this principle. But, but for Rachel, she wanted so desperately to have a son that she would find her own way to do it. And, and the, the use of the Hebrew expression, I think it's lost in some of the newer translations, is so powerful, isn't it? Look at that phrase. And she will bear a child on my knees. She's, she's giving us a visual image. She's going to take this handmaid. And when she's about to give birth, she's going to put her on her knees so that it will appear that the child that is born is actually from Rachel. I've done it. I've given birth to a child, to a son that can be given to you. Jacob. And when we stop to think about that, and we now read these words, God has vindicated me. He has listened to my plea and given me a son. We understand how incorrect it was. She had vindicated herself. She had judged herself. She had found a way to deliver on the problem that she had. And I guess we might summarize that particular Spirit as this. My plan is God's plan. And you know, so often in our lives, we find ourselves in that situation. We find ourselves impatient, not willing to wait for God to work in us and through us. And so what we do is eventually we find our own way to do whatever it is we want to achieve. But there's something a bit more insidious here, isn't there? And, and we're good at doing this as well. We, we work our own solution and then we ascribe it to God. We find a way to, to, to manipulate what we have done and say, well, it's the work of God. Now, I can't test it in you and you can't test it in me, but in our hearts and in our conscience, we can sometimes see that. And this is where this dangerous spirit lies. This thing that God cannot, through his mercy, because God's mercy cannot deal with autonomy. God's mercy is only dependent on one thing, that you are dependent on him. The, the unforgivable sin, that sin that says the spirit and power of God, the Holy Spirit, has no power in my life because my power is what counts, becomes the unforgivable sin. My plan is God's plan. Now, we see this now in the spirit of the birth of Dan, the echoes of Genesis, that something about Dan speaks to this desire to, to execute our own will. But as we go through now, very quickly we'll do it, as we go through other parts of Dan, we see the same idea coming through. So, for example, um, you'll know that Jacob gave these blessings to the 12 children. Uh, and they summarized the characteristics of each of the children. So up on the screen here, when he was blessing Judah, he, he summarized the fact that Judah was going to be a leader. Maybe he really had demonstrated those qualities. And he, and, and he said, you're like a lion. And from this, we get the idea of the lion of the tribe of Judah. You're a great leader. What did he say when he came to to Dan. He said, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. So isn't this an amazing description of what we had seen with Rachel? This idea that Dan is going to judge his people, I don't think he means Become a judge on behalf of God. He's going to judge his people, we'll see in a, in a bit later, according to his own ways, his own rules. And not only is he going to do that, he's going to be very deceptive. He's going to come as a snake behind the rider. So he's going to be a snare to the rest of Israel. And he's going to present to them something that looks like the judgments of God, and he's going to take them out, just like the echo of the serpent that said, God knows that the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will become like him. In other words, to present that, that this opportunity that you have, Eve, is really not that bad because really it's just a way in which you can make the judgments of God yourself. You can discern between good and evil. And that was really the essence of the serpent's temptation. And no wonder, Jacob says, in Dan is the spirit of that deception. That thing which says, I can make the judgment separate from God, and I can ascribe it to God. Isn't it interesting that suddenly at the end of his description of Dan, Jacob puts verse 18. And when you're reading it, you think, well, why has he put that in there? What's that got to do with the rest? I have waited for your salvation 
O Lord. Isn't that the essence of it? When is it that we, we want to execute our own judgment? When is it that we want to do it our way when we're no longer prepared to wait? You see, patience is one of those incredible qualities of God. It's, it's in almost all the lists that represent the characteristics of God. If you go to Exodus chapter 34, uh, it's the third, long-suffering, merciful, gracious, long-suffering. You go to the, um, the fruit of the Spirit, we've got love, joy, peace, patience. You go to the uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, definition of love, love is kind, love is patient. Over and over again, patience. This incredible quality of waiting for the salvation of the Lord. And Rachel couldn't do it. And it's built into Dan. And Dan cannot wait for God's will to be worked out. The very essence, when it comes down to the crunch with the Lord Jesus Christ, what is it that he's tested on in the garden? It all comes down to this, that your will may be done and not mine. That was the essence of the test. And so when we go and have a look at the, the nation of Dan, the tribe that was born out of the spirit, we're not surprised that we find that they called the, 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 the city that was the capital of Dan after the name of Dan. He was their leader, so let's call it Dan. He's going to be our judge. And they, 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 the children, it says verse 30, of Dan set up for themselves a carved image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity. And so they set up for themselves Micah's carved image which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. What did they do? They decided, you know what, we're still going to worship. Oh, yes. We, we still believe in God. We were seeing this, what did you call it? Uh, it was a better word. Syncris- what was it? Syncretism. Syncretism. Beautiful word. Syncretism. They mixed what worked for them together what looked like divine and godly worship. Own priesthood. Still got a priesthood. We've got places to worship. Don't need to go down to Shiloh. Let's, let's mix what God has given us, but that which is inconvenient we'll take out and present it back as something acceptable. You see, what's so powerful about this, this isn't just a normal sin. God can deal with those. He's promised us that he'll wash them away. This cannot be dealt with. You won't be amongst Revelation chapter 7 with this condition. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba, they shall fall, and look what it says, and never rise again. In this state, in this state, what is called the sin of Samaria, when you have given yourself over to independence from God, self-reliance, autonomy, driving your own judgments, there is no place. You shall never rise again. So in summary, we have this, this wonderful uh, 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 message coming to us from this little meditation. Learning to submit our will to God. We've got to understand in our daily living that, that He is the potter and we're the clay. And how often we want to resist Him. We're impatient. We're not willing to let Him work with us. Patiently waiting for His will to be done. There's no place, is there, for the spirit of Dan in the seal of God. God God cannot, the one thing he will not and cannot do is cure self-vindication. And so let's be aware of that. There is an abundant entry, we're being taught in Revelation chapter 7, an abundant entry into the kingdom for all of us. And that's an inspiration. And that's an encouragement. Except if we refuse to submit our will. If we make our judgments God's judgments. If we choose not to wait for the salvation of God. So there's a a meditation on, on, on some names and some people that we can go back and listen to the echoes uh, from the Old Testament. Let's keep in this theme, and I want to draw your attention to this passage, also a very well-known passage from Revelation chapter 2 and at verse 17. So let's read it together. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on that stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So thinking again about echoes of themes and names, in the previous one we were looking at the the names of the children of Israel. Here we have direct reference to this name that's going to be given to us, this beautiful idea that we can imagine ourselves. I I can picture it so, so beautifully, being there, 
being accepted by Jesus, waiting as he comes to me and he presents me with a white stone. And as I grab that white stone and I turn it over, it says it has a new name for me. And it's powerful because it says, you know that new name that you're going to get? No one else would have heard of it before. It's an interesting thought. You know, we we often think about the fact that we have taken on the name of God. Of course, that's central to, to the gospel message, isn't it? This idea that Simeon has declared our God at the first had visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Yes, we are called out to bear the name of Yahweh, the name of God, the name that was given to Jesus that is above every name. But there's a sense in this meditation that there is a new name. A name that is given to us personally that no one else knows except him who receives it. And this is where my focus went. This is where my thought process went as in terms of not just the echoes that abound throughout the word of God on names, but the, the idea of giving and receiving names. That, that we will receive a new name that seems to be very personal. Now, if we think about names very quickly, let's think about names very quickly. We, we each have two names. Some of you may have more because your parents were feeling generous and had the money to give you more names. But we at least hopefully each have two names that are used to identify us uniquely. We have our surnames. We call them our family names, our second names. And primarily, if you think about your surname, it's a name that, yes, it identifies you, but it more identifies you in terms of belonging. So you can tell a lot about someone by knowing their surname. You can often tell where they came from. So if your surname is Slamini, you probably haven't heard that in the USA. That's a very common surname back here. You will work out, this chap doesn't come from the USA. He probably comes from somewhere else. And I can tell you, he comes from a province called KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. If the person's name is uh, Trump, uh, you probably work out that uh, he comes from, uh, where should I say, Russia. Russia, must be Russia, yes. (laughs) But we can work out a lot from the surname of the individual and who they belong to. And in many ways, the name that we've been called to is our family name. We're going to belong to the family of God. But then we have a first name. And you know, our first names are are a lot about our individuality, aren't they? We we associate people's first names with their individual personality traits. That's why often if we've had a bad experience with a particular first name and then the wife says she'd like to call someone by that name, you're like, oh, can't touch it. You know, love to call my child Adolf. Like, ah, oh, Adolf's not working for me. All right. So, so first names talk to individualization. And, and there is a, an idea here, isn't there, in Revelation chapter 2, in this meditation, that, that although we are called to be one, although we are called to bear that one name, we are diverse. I mean, God is the creator of diversity. If that were not true, then why is it that every one of us has a, 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 a absolutely unique fingerprint, an absolutely unique eye, an absolutely unique DNA? Everything completely unique. Every snowflake that falls is completely unique. He is a God that creates diversity and brings it into unity, not uniformity. So there's a sense that, that, that as an individual, you have a name that fits into your belonging name. And I want to explore this idea, this idea of of first names, because I think this is what's been captured in in Revelation chapter 2. Let's think quickly about giving and receiving of names. Have you ever noticed this in the book of Genesis? Of course, you've noticed the passage. This is our Genesis gene. That that in the midst of all the intensity of everything that's going on in Genesis and all the, the things that are being explained to us, it makes so much sense. We have this curious event where Adam is taken And God says, I'm going to bring the animals in front of you and you can name them. And he gets to name all of the beautiful animals of God. Why did God do that? And why is it recorded for us? It's the first time that name appears in the Bible. Adam called them, every living creature, the name that he would give them. And such was his name. The first time it appears. So there's there's a DNA in this. There's something for us to understand. I want to put it to you this. You see, the... The the characteristic of God that we often don't talk about, but it is the very first thing we learn about God, is that he is creative. The the first thing we, we read in the beginning, God created. He's a creative God. He's innovative. He's about making things. 
And that's what he did. He made the whole earth and this beautiful uh, landscape that we're enjoying this week. And in a sense, what did he do? He created this incredible fabric of creation and he, he makes one part of that creation special with the ability to also create. With the intellect and the power and the free will to also be creative. It's what's unique about humans compared to the rest of the creation. And the way that he demonstrates that that's what he wants is he says to Adam, you know what, I've done this creation, but I want you to finish it off. You know, it's often the honor and the privilege if you're a scientist and you discover something new. It's the honor and the privilege of the scientist to be able to name. It is the privilege of the, the, the creator to name that which he's created. So we get the privilege when we uh, give birth to a, a, a baby as the mom and dad who've been heavily involved in the creative part to name the child. We wouldn't feel very good if we have the child and some person, the doctor walks in and says, oh, this looks like an author and gives the name. And so it is when someone discovers a new, a new star or some new discovery, they name it. It's a part of the creative process. And I think this idea that, that, that name giving is given to Adam is really God saying, I've called you to be a co-creator with me. The, the first commandment he ever gave, the first words he ever spoke to man, be fruitful and multiply. We are called not to sit back, not to, to hold on to the very little that we have. God says, I want you to grow. I want you to be abundant, but I want you to grow in supporting my creative work. Understanding that you have to create together with me, the idea of co-creation. Now, this is a very important insight, especially for me. It, it, it teaches us that in every part of our life, we have a way to, to live out our calling, whether it be at work, whether it be in, in, in our uh, uh, relaxation time, whether it be in the family. We are being called to use our creativity to ultimately move his plan forward. And that's what he was calling Adam to do. Now, if you think I'm making too much of that, when, when the first human is named, who was given the right to name the first human? Well, the, often the, 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 the spontaneous answer is, well, that was God. Because the first human named is Adam. And if I have my slides up there, I'd be able to show you that actually Adam never received a name. Okay? So Adam, who we know as Adam, in fact, all that is, is the Hebrew word that describes the creation of man. In fact, when we first have the, um, the uh, now I'll use my little glasses, when we first find Adam mentioned, uh, I think uh, his first name is mentioned, if you have your Bibles, you'll pick it up. Uh, his name is first mentioned in Genesis 2 verse 19. First time he's called Adam, if you've got the King James Version. Genesis 2 19. Do you know that the same word has been used nine times before that? Translators just decided at some point we'll just use the Hebrew. So in actual fact, to be consistent, we could just keep calling him man. The man, the man. So the word name, and you can check it, is never used that God named him Adam. I think that's important because the first human ever named is in fact Eve. And that's recorded for us in Genesis 3 verse 20. Adam called his wife's name Eve. You see, this is consistent. God has given name giving to men. And, and it's interesting that the names that are then given, when he gives her the name Eve, he says, she shall be the mother of all living. In other words, the name was to capture the way that person was going to be a part of God's great creative process. She was going to be the beginning of creating living people. And who do you think gave the name to the first human ever born? Of course, it was Adam and Eve. And the first human ever born was Cain. And they gave him his name. And his name actually was a part of the idea. It, it actually means possession. It means possession. Uh, it's quite interesting. When, when Eve names uh, Cain in Genesis 4 verse 1, she said, I have created a man just as the Lord did. She, she's starting to work out that this idea of, of creativity is a part of our calling. The very fact that I can have children, Eve is saying, is demonstration that I'm a co-creator with God. And she was able to name him as demonstration of that. But there's something in the words of Eve that, that, that catches our attention. I have created a man just as the Lord did. And here's the edge, brothers and sisters. It, it, it seems so simple, doesn't it? That, that 
On the one hand, we, we have to rely on God. But you see, God is calling us to be creative. He's calling us to multiply. He's calling us to be abundant. He's calling us to be name givers. But in that process, there is the risk that we become name builders. In that process, we become not co-creators, but self-creators. And as we follow the theme of names, it doesn't take long before we get to the Tower of Babel. And what do they say? Let us make a name for ourselves. And so they go from being name givers, demonstrating the co-creative role that we are being called to, to name givers and name builders. And, and then we come to, to, to the next manifestation of Babylon that we were talking of earlier. And we come to that incredible uh, a passage that I think you will know well. You don't even need to see it on the screen. When uh, Nebuchadnezzar stands on the same plains where they had built the Tower of Babel, where they had built a name for themselves, and, and captures the very, the very spirit of Babylon. When he says, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by the power of my might, and for the honor of my name. You see, you see, what has happened here is, is, is Nebuchadnezzar has, has lost contact with the cause of creation. You see, as co-creators, we never lose sight that he is the cause. We, we purely have a fabric. He's given us this incredible fabric. And all we're doing is putting the finishing touches. Finishing touches. But when we lose sight of the cause of our creativity, we will lose sight of the purpose. So Nebuchadnezzar looks at great Babylon and says, this is not this great Babylon that I have built by the power of my might and therefore for my honor. What a great lesson. You know, David, I think, picks up on this idea. David spends so much time, doesn't he, in, in the Psalms. He tells us to constantly be reminded that all that we see out there is a reminder that he is the cause of all creativity. Everything that you've ever achieved is only because he gave you it to work with. So he looks upon the stars and, and, and looks at the heavens and beholds the glory of God, the handiwork of God. And because David always understood that God was the cause of creativity, he therefore understood that he was the purpose. In other words, it was always to his glory. That was why when David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, the first thing he did as it came as a manifestation of the glory of God is he took off his crown, he took off his royal robe so that he could say, here is the purpose of creativity. Here is where the glory be belongs. Of course, his wife, Marka, looked at that and she couldn't see what he was doing. You have made yourself as one of the, the vulgar ones because you have humbled yourself in the sight of the commoners. So when we look to ourselves and we understand that we are called to be name givers, to be co-creators. And yet, in doing that, as we gain success, as we, 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 we get the satisfaction that God always intended you to have in creativity, as we start to get perhaps some accolades behind our name, perhaps it's at the end of your name, PhD, BCom, or whatever it is, or perhaps it's at the front of your name, doctor, professor. And we begin to build. The temptation is we become brand builders. That the legacy moves from being a legacy for God, but a legacy for ourselves. And we're on Facebook and we're on LinkedIn and we can Google ourselves. And our name gets bigger and bigger until such time as we have the spirit of Babylon in each and every one of us. So... I think the lesson is very clear, brothers and sisters. It is for us to understand that he gave us the opportunity. He gave us the blessing of being co-creators so that we could finish his creation. But you know what? Ultimately, he wants to give you that first name that your mom and dad gave you. He wants to change it. He wants to complete his creation in you. And we know that's true from Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. We read in John 1, this, this beautiful passage when John was preparing the message of the gospel. He says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. In those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, it's, it's not about whether we choose, it's about whether we receive. He, he's chosen to give you a new name. He's waiting to give it to you. You all received one from your parents. It wasn't by your will. Not by the will of man or by flesh. You just got it. 
You can't even complain about it. I know some people like to change their names, but that's it. He says, but I am willing to give you a new name. I'm willing to give it to you, but you need to want to receive it. You need to be ready to give up all that you've achieved behind your first name here. And you know what I believe? I believe that when we're in the kingdom with him, and he gives us that white stone, that that new name that's recorded there will summarize everything that we did, all of our talents, all of our skills that co-created with him, that helped us each personally to do something to forward his master plan. And that is why when you turn that stone over and you read that name, though nobody else will know it because they never called you by that name. They called you Harold. They called you Cameron. There is a name that God will give that summarizes everything you ever did to co-create with him. And to me, that is so inspirational because today we're working on that new name and we need to hold on to it and make sure we don't hold on to the name that we were given by our parents. So may God bless you as you continue to meditate on the book of Revelation.